Hi everybody, we are in week 11 of graduate statistics. This is video lecture two. We're working with an analysis to answer the following question. Are the, is the race distribution in the juries of a county in Ohio the same or different from the distribution of races in the population at large? We basically want to determine if there is evidence of selection bias in juries. Given the importance of racial representativeness, it is important to document if we're having the selection bias so these can be corrected. So you're working, you're exercising um, your, or practicing being a data analyst and trying to answer this question. And we talked about how we go about doing that. So we started um, documenting the percentage in the population of these three different races or ethnicities. Um, then we computed the expected counts, given that we have 3,878 juries, we could, based on the proportions, compute what's expected. We have the observed number of juries from each race slash ethnicity. And we, um, we said that the, one of the steps is to quantify the observed deviations. And to quantify the observed deviations, we basically compute the deviation of each one of uh, the categories. We square them, we divide by the expected count, and we sum all of it. And that will give us a chi-square statistic that captures the total deviation that is observed in that particular data set. And then our job, which is step two, is to determine if that deviation is large enough to be atypical under um, random conditions in the absence of selection bias how likely is it that i see this total deviation so the question really becomes which is our step two is to determine the likelihood that one would see the estimated difference between expected and observed counts which is captured in that chi-square statistic that i just told you how to compute if only chance was at play so running the chi-square test for goodness of fit means just that. When we say we are, we are running a statistical test, what we're doing is computing a statistic that captures the particular pattern in the data. In this case, the difference between the overall difference between expected and observed counts. And we determine the likelihood of observing that under random conditions, okay? If the likelihood of observing that magnitude of difference between expected and observed is very, very, very low under random conditions, we then decide that the null hypothesis should be rejected in favor of the alternative hypothesis that suggests that a bias is at play. So before we actually can run the chi-square test and compute the probabilities, we should check for the conditions that allows us to assume that these differences will be distributed as chi-square under random conditions. And these are very simple. Each case only contributes to one cell in that table. And that makes sense because one cell is for the number of juries um, that are white. The other cell is the number of juries that are black. And the other cell is the number of juries that are Hispanic. The same person cannot be at the same time in the white cell and in the black cell, right? Because um, they, you know, the, the idea is that you pick one race and that the jury is just, each jury is just counted once, okay? If there was a mixed race category, then the person would be there. It doesn't mean that if the person is mixed race, they would be counted twice. That's not how this data works. We need to guarantee that this is the case. If the same person is counted twice, then it does not meet the conditions to run a chi-square test. Okay, and then each particular scenario, each cell must have at least five expected cases. So when you compute the expected cases, each cell should have more than five. And if you look here on our expected counts, each cell has way more than five, okay? All right, so then we need to identify the correct chi-square distribution because you know, it varies depending on degrees of freedom. And to compute the degrees of freedom, you just get the number of cells. In this case, we have three because we have three different race slash ethnicities. 
and uh, minus one gives us two degrees of freedom. Okay. <clears throat> then the last next step is to obtain the probability of the estimated deviation or the calculated chi-square statistics under the null hypothesis. The probability of observing that particular chi-square or larger under the hypothesis that no selection bias is at play. So if the chi-square distribution is this blue one that we pick, we need to find our, oops, we need to find the value of our statistic right here in this x-axis and compute the probability of finding that in larger. So let's do that. So let's compute the chi-square statistic looking at our data. So before we do that, let's recall what our hypotheses are that we're testing. Age zero is that we observed counts of jurors from various race slash ethnicities follow the same race slash ethnicity distribution in the population. Alternative hypothesis is that the observed counts of jurors from various ethnicities do not follow the same race ethnicity distribution in the population. So how do we compute the chi-square, which is one of the steps um, that we need to do? We compute by finding the difference between the expected and observed white jurors, squaring it, dividing by the expected. I do the same for the black jurors. I do the same for Hispanic jurors. I compute the deviations in each one of the cells. I sum this all up and I find that the total deviation, square deviation, is 48.3. So now we compute the degrees of freedom. You probably are not seeing it at the bottom of the screen, but it's K, which we have three cells, white, black, and Hispanic, minus one. So we have two degrees of freedom. Then we compute the p-value. The p-value for a chi-square test is defined as the tail area above the calculated statistic. Because the test statistic is always positive, a higher test statistic means a higher deviation from the null hypothesis. So here is um, the deviation. Um, look, that's the probability of finding, I get the chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom, and I compute the probability of finding 48.03 or higher, uh, considering that the distribution of expected deviations would look like this under the null hypothesis. And then we compute using the p chi-square uh, function in R. We can put the chi-square value here, the number of degrees of freedom, saying that we want upper tail by setting the lower tail to false, and we find a p-value that's very, very, very tiny. And that leads us to uh, reject the null hypothesis. Right, because the probability of observing this large deviation is very, very tiny, right, under condi random conditions. So we say no, no to this hypothesis, and we accept the alternative instead. So the decision is to reject the norm. To interpret this in the context of data, I should say something like there is evidence that jury selection process is biased, and in particular against black individuals, right? Because if you look, at, and the chi-square statistic does not tell me this, what tells me this is looking at the deviations here. The larger deviation is the deviation between observed and expected for uh, the black individuals, right? But it's biased against both black and Hispanics because we get less observed jurors from these, this race and this ethnicity uh, than would be expected just by chance. And it favors selection of white individuals because we observe more white jurors than is expected under the null hypothesis. So that would be the interpretation. See how statistics can be useful? We can use data to provide support to these activists that are trying to get better distribution, more representativeness of the different races um, in juries. All right, ready for the next problem? The next problem has to do with police shootings. And what I want to accomplish with this particular example is to not only show you a different application of the same test in a slightly different situation, I also would like to discuss how people can sometimes use data 
and say things that are indeed true and oversimplify conclusions from data. And it's really important that we think critically about data um, in order to be able to kind of argue against some simplistic conclusions that people can make based on just raw distributions of counts. So let's start with this. This is something I found online. It's a database. Uh, this database is based on news reports, public records, internet databases, and original reporting. And I can't remember which um, newspaper um, website has it. I don't. I think it's the Washington Post, but I can't be sure. Maybe New York Times. I got this a couple of years ago. So here's what the data shows in terms of police shooting statistics in 2015. 497 white individuals were shot by the police, 259 black individuals were shot by the police, 172 Hispanic individuals were shot by the police, and 67 were shot by the police um, whose race was either unknown or some other race, maybe um, mixed race or other um, ethnicities. All right, now, a simplistic conclusion that somebody can make from this data uh, by looking only at the raw numbers is that more whites are killed by police than blacks. And that's true. This is not, this piece is not a lie. More, this data shows that in 2015, more whites were killed by the police than black individuals. I mean, you look and it's true, right? What, what is simplistic is the hypothesis that racial bias is false because we're looking at this distribution and we are seeing that the raw counts of white individuals show that more white individuals were killed than black individuals. So one more time with feeling. Some person can look at this data and come to you and say, see, more whites are killed than blacks. So this story about biases in police shootings is not just not true. Right? And I'm saying this is a simplistic conclusion. You cannot arrive at that conclusion based on only these numbers. In the same way that on the past example, we could not arrive at the conclusion that there was a bias against, uh, uh, by a selection bias in juries, just because we saw more white individuals in, the, in, in being jurors than black individuals and Hispanic individuals, right? Because we have to look at things in proportion to the distribution in the population, right? So just as we can expect to see more white individuals in juries because there, is, there are more white individuals in the population, we would expect, even under no bias, that there would be more white individuals being shot than black individuals. But we need to determine, to determine if there is some bias against a particular race in police shootings, we need to see if the number of people being killed or being shot from each race is similar to what would be expected if shootings were happening only by chance alone, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. So the, the challenge that we have here to do together is to demonstrate why this conclusion is sort of naive interpretation of the data at best, right? Because some people might just look at this data naively because of lack of understanding of data analysis and statistics, um, naively say, huh, maybe there is no bias. Actually, bias might be against white individuals. They are killed more. Um, and that's at best, but some people would use that type of data to and, and misconstruct it for malicious purposes. And that's, you know, that happens sometimes not only with police shooting statistics, of course, but with other, with other um, uses of data as well. So I think teaching statistics is a public service. That's what I, I take it as. Um, that's why I take my job, I think, very, very seriously. So again, this is our class challenge that we will address in the next video. There is a simplistic conclusion based on raw counts that uh, because more whites are killed by policemen than black individuals, then the hypothesis of racial bias in um, police shootings is false.
Okay, so let's address that and check that together uh, using chi-square chi test um, um, as a tool. All right, see you on the next video.